Good evening. This is Howard K. Smith. That voice belongs to a member of the Beat Generation, to a young man on the road to making a search for himself. This is a collective portrait painted in words by the subjects themselves. Like all portraits, the composite effect depends in large degree on the angle of vision of the artists. We attempt tonight to present you with a picture of the era in which we have lived since the end of the Second World War, a picture drawn by those in revolt against some of the aspects of the hidden revolution. For this is an impression of the cool rebellion, a study of the beat generation. We have spoken through this series of broadcasts of the changes that have occurred in American society since the turn of the century. We have probed the technological and social upheavals that have occurred throughout the Western world, upheavals termed by some the hidden revolution. It is perhaps fitting that we examine some of the fruits of that revolution in terms of the battle for survival of the individual personality in a tragic century. We have chosen to look at our accomplishments through the eyes of some of the children of the age. For children are notoriously contemptuous of the shape of the world which their predecessors have passed on. It is hoped that by looking at our world through the eyes of those who claim to reject it, we may come upon some important truths. It has been noted many times over that a prism through which light is reflected often provides a freshness of view, a kind of truth, just because of the oblique angles at which the rays hurl themselves through the glass just because of the distortions they suffer in their passage into the reflector. Let us then use the beat generation as our prism. Let us examine the cool rebellion. Everybody seems to think it's so important that you have to grab for money all the time, you know. Seems to be the main goal in everybody's life. And my parents don't seem to be any the happier for it. In fact, they're always arguing and they're always discontent, you know, they always want they want more than they have. They have a nice home. It's not paid for. They have a car. They have furniture and all that. But all they, they, they don't enjoy anything. They just sit home night after night and they keep thinking about what a rut they're in, but <laughs> they don't do anything to get out of it. And I'm going to see if I can't build myself kind of a life where I can really enjoy things, you know, and not uh, be glued to one spot. I, I don't mean, you know, fly here and there, but be able to um, not be so uh, stuck on material possessions, you know, so that I can't leave them and go someplace else. The speaker is a 19-year-old girl who now makes her home in Venice West, eight miles south of Los Angeles. In the past five years, Venice has been celebrated as the Mecca of the Beats, a haven for those searching for new ways, new meanings. Talk to a dozen Beats and you'll find a dozen reasons for coming to Venice West or a place like it. But many of the individual plaints about life in Squaresville have a common ring. A 30-year-old woman, a successful singer, expresses herself with vigor. We find we can do without immense quantities of goods that would tie us to jobs we hate or de would become jobs that we hated <clears throat> if we had to have them to pay off things. Do you see? Now, there's one trap right there, strictly Squaresville. They accept it as their lot. This is life in Squaresville, as I see it. I am not entrapped by, I am not hoodwinked into wanting a lot of junk and getting, getting a job that gives me a lot of money for the junk. Uh, the fancy this and the expensive that and close the cha ah, close the change every year. Why? When they're still just as good last year. I have never whined to my husband for uh, anything really, a uh, material. Let's buy the book we want. Let's buy the records we want. Let's buy the lychee nuts. <laughs> Silly things like that. Not the fashionable things to want. We buy what we want. What shapes attitudes like these? What shaped my own life the most markedly? It wasn't the Great Wars, and it wasn't the Holocausts in all continents, because looking over history, there have always been wars. There always would be the benign and the belligerent. Wasn't it Mark Twain who said that? Always! The thing that really terrified me, when I'm sure I was only 11 at the time, possibly 12, a social studies teacher that wanted desperately to be a chicken farmer. And I got out of him one day during a noon period. Why weren't you a chicken farmer? Don't you know how? He said, certainly. He'd been raised on a chicken ranch. Well, then why not? Well, it seems that he'd met 
at college, a girl who was going to major in teaching, and he decided to marry her, so he went along too, and she didn't want to be a chicken rancher's wife. She wanted to be a teacher, and there you are. Someone forced into a life he did not want for whatever reason. There's never a good reason. That's what terrified me. It was the personal issue of living. It's the everyday living that we're faced the most with, and it's the most important job. It, it, it's, it's, it's everything we have, we've got. It's all we've got. Allen Ginsberg, author of How, perhaps the outstanding poet produced by the Beat Group, finds the very phrase Beat offensive. It has, according to Ginsberg, lost its very meaning through excessive use in the popular media. Nevertheless, he is, in a sense, the personification of the movement's intellectual viewpoint. Ginsberg has strong feelings about the way most people spend their lives. Working for a living without any interest in the actual work you're doing is kind of a horrible situation to be in, and that's the situation most people are in. How many people are doing things that they like to do all day long, that eight hours a day, that they really like to do, that they would do if they didn't have to? Not too many. If you've got the uh, greater portion of the uh, material economy dependent on a uh, war situation, that means that you've got the greater portion of your working people working at something that has no relation to any kind of human value at all. Just doing purely mechanical and ultimately destructive work. And like, what, what kind of life can these people be having? This must be a nightmare. In Venice, a reporter finds that Allen Ginsberg is not alone in his denunciation of the national climate. Our man participated in a conversation with poet-painter Stuart Perkoff and another Venice artist. The session took place in Perkoff's pad, our apartment as he and his roommate worked on their current projects. The country and the people for after the, the Second World War, which I, I feel like is all my generation, like it's, it's been as a unit. We've, like we were a team fighting them, like, like the Korean seed, we were a, thing, a, a unit fighting them. Now, there is no them anymore. Like, they keep stirring up the thing about Russia, but, like, I don't think they'll let n anything will happen. Like, it's like it, when the people realize that they're, they're not all together, like they're all individuals, like, where they all sit down and find out, like, that they have their own sound. Like, we, we're not banded together no more. Well, you think that's true? I, I, I mean, I don't feel like I'm on no team. Well, that's what I'm saying. But, like, before... We had the war, right? It was the war effort. We were all, the country was a team, fighting as a oh, team. Oh, a time ago, man. Oh, you mean the Korean War? Oh, I don't yeah. think about that. I was off the team by then, see? There's no more, there's no wars. There's not going to be any wars. Whew. And, he, like, here we are with time <laughs> on our hands. I've been political all my life, see? When I've got, the Second World War was important to me because it was a war against fascism. And then we're, you know, it was all based on lies. It was all lies. And that's when the team fell apart, as far as I'm concerned. Like in 1945, when they dropped the atom bomb. I mean, you know, what are you going to do? There are so many factors involved, and there's no way to touch any of them. There's no way to touch the army. There's no way to touch this, the various sicknesses that are rampant in the society. There's no way to touch the... the, uh, the walls that people have built around themselves and their worlds so that they can't see the truth or don't want to. There's no way for anybody to do it except God. See, the thing, the thing before I met Stuart, I would have, I would, if I was a poet then, I would have wrote protest sounds. It had been a, I did. It'd sound about the bomb. But except there's something else. Like I found, I found that a, a, about love. I think love is stronger than any bomb, and I think there's like I don't feel. I don't, I don't fear the bomb, man. You I don't fear anything, I man. I said, but like there's too there's too much to hope, man. There's too much good things. No, I, I, the thing is that that's its future. It's like not existent. Yeah. You can't go around worrying about what's going to happen ten years from now. Yeah. Because it's not real. Because really, only now is real. Things you touch and see and smell and taste, that kind of reality. Only now is real. The past is over. The future isn't here yet. The future isn't here yet. 
Stuart Perkoff lives in and for the moment. Is this view representative of those held by most of the members of the Beat Generation? Lawrence Lipton, foremost chronicler of the Beats, is author of The Holy Barbarians, a study of life in Venice, California. They are entirely individualistic in their belief and in their way of life. It is true that they resemble one another in certain basic respects, but beyond that, their way of life, even their so-called conformism of dress, is largely a myth. They are bearded and unbearded. They're sandaled and unsandaled. In Venice, you'll find them frequently barefooted because they live by the ocean in a semi-tropical climate. Now, the reason why they reject such labels is because they are refugees from the rat race, which is bedeviled by labels. They are running away from labels, and they don't want labels attached to them. They have disaffiliated themselves from the reigning values of the society so completely that between the square and the cat, the split is so great that the two can hardly understand one another. We were fortunate enough to have microphones present at a rare event. The place, a coffee house in North Beach, San Francisco, where the Beats gather to gaze at their espresso as they listen to the latest in progressive jazz. The event itself embodied an effort Mr. Lipton would have thought most unlikely. A cat or hipster trying to build a bridge to two squares on a tourist swing. All parties to the discussion found the going somewhat rough. Uh, you're not going along uh, for the basis of the fact that right now, that, let's put it this way, that, that beatnik is in style. I'm glad to be in public eye. I think I, almost anybody, you know, is if they'll really come down and admit it. It doesn't plague me at all if somebody calls me a beatnik. There are times, you know, if somebody... I'm being very honest with you. All right. For example, today, I was walking by Grace Cathedral, and uh, the little boys in their blue shirts, you know, and going to the cathedral school and all this jazz started to rag me. So I said nothing more than the fact that I had sang, or I had been the lead singer for eight years in an Anglican choir, you know, and that I had served three bishops as an acolyte after I left that, you know, and that they might do well to look within themselves, to see the seed of myself, you know, I my own sanity. You escape, you know. I think you are looking for something that you haven't found. That's not uh, escapism. Escape. I'm, you're looking for something you haven't found. You're driving in a, in a direction. I'm driving. Ambition's driving me. Too. Ambition. All right. If you call it ambition, I call it something else. I'm looking for an ultimate goal. I tried no, to no, find it in the it service. Out. I think perhaps that uh, I feel my responsibility is more than you do. My first responsibility would be my family. And I think that should be yours. Well, you see, I was raised to think exactly the same thing. And I fought against it. But it came to... not like regimentation. I know that. Discontent. I think it is a shame, an absolute shame, that a man of your intelligence... I'm not saying this in a derogatory manner, believe me. That a man of your intelligence doesn't put what you think to work in a proper way. Well, you see, that's... You're going to have to find your God. That's the first thing you're going to have to find. Well, I don't, I don't feel I need God. I have faith in myself. I, I, I think I got the answer. Why? Emotionally, you're immature. Immaturity is a matter of definition, and who is considered to be so is often closely related to who is doing the defining. But in the case of the beat generation, those who level the charge have a somewhat surprising ally these days. In fact, poet Kenneth Rexroth, once considered to be a high priest of the beats, carries his indictment a good deal further. Here we have a cafe in a little California beach town, or an identical cafe in Vancouver, B.C., or an identical cafe in Marseille, or an identical cafe in Tokyo. And here are people in beards and bare feet busy sitting around writing poetry. Well, <laughs> these people are simply status seekers. This is a struggle for in-group prestige. It fulfills all the definitions that the sociologists have elaborated to take care of the most conventional and most commercialized behavior. But for some, the attempt to escape from the mass molds of the 20th century does not represent failure or futility. Pierre Delat is a congregational clergyman who ministers to one of the most unusual congregations in the world. The Reverend Derlatch operates the bread and wine mission in North Beach, San Francisco. 
It is his feeling that this cool rebellion of which we have spoken is an immensely important spiritual manifestation. Now, re recently, down in the basement of our, of our building here, we uncovered, much to our dismay, a group of some eight or nine pads, which have been little apartments which have been made up in the storage vaults. And uh, these were covered with wonderful Japanese mats and burlap on the walls and had hibachi stoves and modern paintings and candelabra. It was rather touching to look at the books on the shelves. If you'd broken into similar subterranean pads during the 30s, they would all, all been books on Marxism and capitalism and political books. But these were all theological books, almost all of them. Books on Zen Buddhism, on early Christian mystics, on the Apocrypha, books of this sort. I think that the, the prevalent preoccupation uh, in North Beach has been with uh, religion, the quality of life whereby you stake your life on what you consider to be holy or to be the ultimate good. And uh, while a few people here stake their life on it totally, they do more so than uh, elsewhere, where if, if when the chips are down, I think people would always choose their car over God. The daily press, magazines, radio, television, and the motion picture industry have brought to our attention one, perhaps the most superficial, of the aspects of the beat generation. It is the preoccupation with coolness that most of us associate with this movement. In North Beach, where the beats take themselves seriously, being cool has a philosophical basis. For all, or most of these people, are fleeing from the shuck, in our language, the lie of social existence. Literary critic Malcolm Cowley has lived through many of the cultural and social rebellions of the era of the hidden revolution. He has given a good deal of thought to the causes of each of the major protests he has observed. We asked him to consider with us the validity of objections to the contemporary social structure. The individual has a tougher time these days than he had in the 19th century because they start right out in school training us not to be individuals. Our kids go to school and the teacher says, uh, little Johnny is uh, very bright. He reads perhaps too well, but uh, he hasn't yet learned to adjust himself to the group. She never asks whether it's a good group or a bad group. The duty of little Johnny is to adjust. Then he gets out of school and goes into business. And never before have there been such great rewards for adjusting yourself to the organization. We used to give them little things. Now they give them ranch houses, three cars in every garage, winter vacations in Nassau, everything else. If you adjust, if you don't adjust in the personnel man calls you in and says to you, I see that you're not happy here at the blank company and perhaps you'd better look for some place where you'd fit in better with the group. How does the situation of the beat generation compare to the social protesters of the 1930s? In the 1930s, people's activities were turned outside towards society. They neglected what was inside them. It was always we can be saved by a change in society. We are changing the world. The world will get better on account of our efforts. In the 1960s, if you try to break inside what people were thinking, you'll find them saying, the world is going to hell in a hack. Society is all bad. There's nothing we can do to change it. We're absolutely powerless except on one point we can become meaningful individuals. We can become meaningful individuals. Mr. Cowley's analysis has much in common with those of other keen social observers. If the objective of the cool rebellion is to make it possible for the preservation of individuality in what John Galbraith has termed the affluent society, then few of us will say it nay. We can, however, ask ourselves, where lies responsibility for this revolt against our style of life? Most of the people we have listened to this evening have discussed war, materialism, the increasing pace of the rat race as being basic to their disaffiliation from contemporary mores. Although a good many of the statements of the discussion have been extreme, there is perhaps a grain of truth in the overall protest. 
We owe it to ourselves and to the progress which we have made in the past to see to it that material prosperity is intertwined with individual freedom, with spiritual aspiration. To be aware of the possibility of the loss of individuality is the first step in making sure we treasure it as the most important part of our heritage. Only then can we preserve the valuable harvest reaped over the past 50 years by the hidden revolution.